I'm going to ask Frank to begin here. And Frank, you know, what I am think we all could profit in hearing from is your take on, first of all, the success of these laws. I mean, and the impact that you think they've had on um, censorship conflicts that occur in the states. And, and the other thing that I'm really interested in hearing your perspective on is, you know, what are the provisions in drafting a statute? Because there obviously are, you know, now seven different versions plus, plus the SPLC model legislation. Um, what are the key provisions that you think really need to be there and are worth, you know, fighting, you know, to make sure don't get excluded? Okay, thanks. Um, I'll dispense with the great war story that I had in deference to your time. <laughs> 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 Let's dive straight into it. Um, I mean, I think, you know, First of all, thanks to Kent State and to you for pulling this together. I, I, I'm sure you're going to get thanked a lot today, but I can't thank you enough. You guys are the only organization I think that was in a position to get all of these people together around the table, and it's so important that we do that as a first step and do it do it now before the legislature start at the first of the year. Um, the fact that we're sitting here talking about this, I think, points up what is, to me, the most crying foundational need before we can take this campaign very much further, and that is to say, we really have a desperate need for data. We really have a desperate need for hard facts. Uh, some of you know I spent 15 years in Congress and state legislatures working as a reporter before ever coming to, to the practice of law. and. My experience from that process is that what is going to carry the day is statistics, facts, actual experiences, and not speculation. And so to the extent that we're able to show that, you know, things like it is provably false that enacting a student free press statute in your state will open floodgates of litigation, right? To the extent that we're able to show that that is provably <coughs> false through statistics, that can do nothing but advance our case. So I guess I preface what I'm saying by saying uh, you are going to hear from me a dearth of statistics. You're going to hear from me anecdotal information uh, at best, and that's where we are, I think, right now. Um, anecdotally, what I can say is do student free press statutes prevent censorship, not as far as our experience can tell you. Our experience is that, frankly, some of the states that have student free press statutes are the source of some of the most flagrant censorship complaints and certainly some of the, the highest volume of censorship complaints. California was always and still is today the, the, most, uh, 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 the most prevalent source of censorship complaints for us. Now, again, this gets us into a quandary. Do student free press statutes prevent censorship, or do they alert people to the existence of a right that they may not otherwise have known? I think you can make a glass half full, glass half empty argument that having that statute and having the awareness and the high profile of it in California has caused students to ring our telephone in a way that students in Virginia or South Carolina may not. And so I, I think that is a, a, a way to look at this, and unfortunately, you know, Either perspective is arguably valid. Um, but what I will say, what I will say that we can say anecdotally for sure is that having a free press statute makes the dispute resolution process go much faster and usually produce a better outcome. Okay, that to me is the demonstrable benefit. That can we show that it prevents censorship? No, but can we show, at least through our anecdotal experience, that it causes people to give students a better resolution and a better outcome? That I think we can say with some confidence. Why is that? Because in a state like a Virginia or like a South Carolina or like a Tennessee that doesn't have this statute, you walk into the conversation at a disadvantage. You walk into the conversation with the school attorney or the administrator, and what you can say is, well, there's no authority in the courts in your state, but if the courts in your state decide things about like the ones in California, here's what we can, uh, our best guess as to what, what the way things will come out. And that's not a very compelling argument. Think about <coughs> how much more compelling it is if you're able to sit down with an administrator or a school lawyer and say, well, in fact, we don't have to speculate about what the courts are going to do in your state because here's what the legislature has said. Thou shalt not cross these lines. Boom, 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 boom. That is almost always a conversation killer right there. I mean, that is conclusive. And so that, to me, is what we can say about our experience with the statutes. 
Um, let me just sort of address, because it, it is a, a good question about kind of what are the key ingredients in a successful statute and what are the decision points that people drafting one have to confront. And you do have page 27 of the packet is the model SPLC statute, but that's very much a work in progress and I think needs to be informed by real experience on the ground. Um, one of the things that that statute lacks that to me I would put as an absolute uh, uh, minimum prerequisite for a successful statute is an award of attorney's fees provision. I would absolutely put in any statute an entitlement to attorney's fees because to me, uh, uh, First Amendment cases, free speech cases generally result in no more than nominal damages. And so in order for there to be a sting attached, there's got to be this, the specter of paying the opponent's attorney's fees. You know, and put yourself in the posture of an administrator right now. It's all a matter of evaluating risk and reward, right? And if the only risk is that I'm going to get a court order that says I'm wrong and to let the student publish the, the story, well, what's really my disincentive there, you know, as opposed to the fact is my attorney is telling me, and right now he's telling you correctly, that the odds of your getting sued are infinitesimally small and the odds of your losing a lawsuit are infinitesimally small and so if there's got to be some sting on the other side you know it, it's like uh, speeding right I mean we all know that um, uh, you can drive 57 miles an hour on the highway and not get pulled over but if the speeding ticket was fifty thousand dollars how many of us would drive 57 right we if, if, if we can either increase the certainty of punishment or we can increase the consequences and I think attorneys fees increase the consequences um, you know I, I think we, we definitely have to have, and this is addressed in the SPLC model legislation, something that makes it clear that responsibility and liability follow control. I think that is the number one thing that we hear back from administrators is how in the world do you expect me to turn these crazy kids loose with my resources in a printing press and let them do whatever they want knowing that I'm going to get sued at the end of the day? We've got to have a good answer to that question. And most of the statutes have in there an express immunity provision that says so long as you stay out of the newsroom, you're not responsible for the end result. So that, I think, is, is incredibly important. Um, I also think... And, and, and we can debate strategically whether these need to be married up together or proceed on separate tracks, but an anti-retaliation provision is enormously important, and Senator Yee obviously just got that passed. But without that, without some protection for the advisor, and frankly without some protection for the program itself, if I were drafting a model anti-retaliation provision, I would make it clear that you not only cannot penalize the advisor, that you not only cannot penalize the student, but you cannot discontinue or defund a journalism program for a retaliatory motivation. I mean, you can always do it for a financial reason, but I think there will continue to be holes in retaliation protection as long as schools can say, as we just encountered this past week in California, a school can say, well, we've just decided not to have journalism anymore. And it was clearly tied to a specific editorial content decision that they disagreed with. And so uh, I think those are, to me, kind of the, uh, 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 the, the, the must-haves. And then just in terms of sort of decision points, and I just want to kind of tick these off real quickly for people to think about, and then I want, I want to hand it off couple of the decision points as to which way you go, and I'm not sure I have a firm answer, is do you include all speech or do you include just publications? I think that's a big one. How broad do you go? Do you include buttons, posters, leaflets, signs, or do you just include publications? Do you address prior review. There are statutes that go different ways on this. There are statutes that explicitly say that it is okay for a teacher in an academic setting to review the content, or do you say that prior review is a forbidden form of censorship, or do you stay silent on that? Right? Do you address off-campus speech at all? Okay, This is huge. This is where the First Amendment litigation is going today. This is where the boundaries of the First Amendment are being fought out in our courts. It's not so much what you can say in the newspaper, but what you can say on the blog, what you can say on live journal, what you can say on MySpace. Okay, So the question is, do you try in that same free press bill to, to address the rights of students when they're off campus on purely personal time? Those are sort of my, that's my shopping list, and I'm really interested to hear the experience of people who've been living under these. That's Quick question. Uh, what about uh, online 
or where, what do you think? Oh, I often most of these days you're talking about publications. So what about? What that's about I mean I, I think that's right. I think the question is how do you define? That's that's a good question. How do you define? Many of these statutes use the word publication, and you know as we all know, student media is not limited to paper anymore. There is broadcasting, there is webcasting, there is blogging, and 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 yeah, I think I mean that raises that we encounter an awful lot of issues coming up today about having a presence on a school server and does that entitle the school to a greater degree of involvement and of course the the answer that I always point them to is I give them Diana's contact information and say get on high school journalism and get your paper off of the school server and then you won't have to worry about this but yeah I mean I think that is a valid discussion point is to what extent by statute is it proper for a legislature to say that online publishing is 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 subject to the exact same uh, guidelines as, as paper publishing? But real, I'm sorry, really quick. Yeah. I just have to also say that I work for a school with a great publications policy, and in a in Colorado, which has the student free expression law. And I received in my mailbox earlier this year, and I don't have a copy of it. I'm trying to get my hands on it again because I deleted it because I disagreed with it, and that's kind of how I am. <laughs> um, stating that any teachers ha who have websites, regardless of whether or not they're hosted on the, on the school server, if they're for educational purposes, had to adhere to the district's policy of not publishing names and likenesses on the school server yeah. uh, or on the internet, and I and I really did delete it because I know these guys and I'm in these kind of conversations all the time and I'm very lucky to have privilege to these great minds around me and I was like that'll never hold up in court click, but for the record, my great district has that policy. You know, one thing I would note, James, in relationship to your question, too, is that at, at this point, at least, no court has created, has said one of these existing state laws doesn't apply to online publication, but it's worth issue. Well, you know, Carrie, you started the conversation here, but I think what I'm most interested in is knowing how has it worked in Colorado. You know, as president of the State High School Press Association, you hear from folks all around the state. Um, do you feel like the statute has done what it was intended to do there? Okay, well, I guess as um, just a precursor to what I'm going to say, I grew up in Colorado high school journalism, and I was the editor of my high school yearbook in 1989 and 1990. <coughs> Luckily, it was a fall book because our law was passed in June of 1990, and in um, the fall when it came out, there was a picture that everyone decided was a problem. Uh, we had a pregnant girl in our school. It never happens, by the way. And, and this, nobody knew about that. And nobody knew about it. Yeah. And, uh, and we had this phenomenal picture in it of the star of the basketball team with the basketball pushed up under his jersey, belly to belly with the pregnant girl. And needless to say, in the fall of 1990, when the book came out, that, that caused a bit of a stink. But my advisor um, had always treated us as though we had every right that there ever was, regardless of the law. But when the law actually passed, we all went kind of, Good, but I wasn't ever a part of that. Um, so I've only advised in a state where there's the law. I mean, I don't know what it means to advise in a state where there's not the law. I also advise in a district that they're wonderful. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that censorship still goes on. And so to go back to Frank's point, um, we have a law in Colorado that says that kids who haven't had their license for a year can't have more than one other person in their car. Anybody have that law? Well, it doesn't keep kids from putting five other kids in their car to run to Hardee's for lunch. What it does is it allows the ability to prosecute them for the poor decisions they've made afterwards. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's kind of how our law works. It doesn't keep people from knee-jerk reactions of censorship, but it allows the students in the schools and, and their advisors to come back and say, you can't do that afterwards. It also, and one point that hasn't been made yet, I think, is that it opens the avenue for discussion. I mean, I, I'm i just, you know, a BA plus nothing teacher from down the hallway, and um, I've opened up the discussion with my administration. I, I spoke to the cohort that we have. We have a cohort. Anytime you get hired as a principal or an AP in our district, you spend the first year in like a, a principal's induction program. And I was invited to speak to them on scholastic press rights last year, and specifically on our Colorado law and how they apply. 
And the bottom line is that our administrators don't go through any journalism laws before they become administrator, any journalism law course. They don't know anything about what we do. It's kind of not their fault. I'm, I'm going to say that. Um, we're the experts in our buildings, and it's our jobs to educate everybody else around us. So we spend half our time doing our job with the kids, and we spend half our time becoming this community li liaison for the job. And actually, in my, in, my, um, in my handbook of my publications, I describe my role as being the community liaison for what they do. It's my job to run around and educate everybody else on what their rights are so that my kids can use their rights. So um, I, I think one of the benefits of having the law is that it opens for discussion. You know, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with, te uh, with administrators around my state where I go, are you aware that you're breaking a law? And they go, what? And I go, oh my gosh, I, let, me, let me help you learn about this. And then that becomes an opening to talk about it. Um, it's a knee-jerk reaction. In general, I don't think that administrators actually go over to some dark place when they leave the classroom and become administrators, their knee-jerk reactions come from a place of protecting the school. What they don't understand, and, and that is founded in goodness. They want to protect the school and the students and the community and make sure we have a good reputation that kids through their school of choice efforts come to our school kind of a thing. But, but they don't know that they're doing wrong in many cases and the law allows me to tell them that they are. The, the law also allows me, um, I probably get four or five calls a week from advisors in Colorado who are asking, um, they're telling me I can't do this, can I do this? And, and I say, of course you can. And then I say, um, go to Google, type in Colorado Student Free Expression Law, SPLC, just because it's formatted really nice on that site, by the way. And, the, and I said, print it off, highlight these three lines. And I say, take that into your administrator. And administrators quite often go, oh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay, all right, and then and then the conversation is over at least at least for right then in that moment with that article, and then also the conversation can continue later when it's not in a moment of panic and it's not in a moment of pull the paper before it gets anywhere, because the problem and this is what I say whenever I talk to administrators, the problem is you haven't been asked to know anything about this until you have to make a decision on it, and most education comes after the censorship has already happened. And again, that's where the law steps in for me. Now, um, when Mark and I talked about this last week, he said, if you could change anything about your law, what would it be? And there's actually two things I would change. The first one is, and you guys have my law on page 22, but down at the bottom, point number eight has to do with um, nothing in the publication should help gangs get done what they want to do. And I don't know what kind of a writer that was on the bill. I don't know who put that on there. It's certainly good to dissuade gangs from taking over your newspaper or advertising in your newspaper. I don't know what. I don't really know what the purpose there was, but I do think that um, people are reading down in this very powerful language all the way down, and then they go, huh? So I, if, I, if I could change anything, I would take that out. The other thing I would do is I would reword number six, because if you look at it down towards the bottom, just two above the gangs, um, the, the part that bothers me and that Invariably, if I have a principal who's smart enough to actually read the law and question it, they say, um, it shall not be interpreted to interfere with the authority of the publication advisor to establish or limit writing assignments for the students working with the publication and to otherwise direct and control the learning experience. So I have had that interpreted to say, so you can tell them to write a positive article on the school. You can tell them that their paper shouldn't be so dark about the school. Administrators always believe when the paper comes out that the students involved in writing it somehow hate the school based on what our article's on. And I'm like, no, come on. But they say, you can tell them to, to balance that with more positive pieces. You can tell them that they shouldn't be doing a mean review on the, on the play and things like that. And they use that to... Um, they use that to kind of back up their point when, in fact, that's not what the point of, of the wording is. But, but because it's worded in, in that way, I can see why they try to interpret it, you know. So I think that if I had the ability to change it, it would be that. Um, a couple things we've really got going for us in Colorado. Um, Pat Pasco, who was instrumental in getting the law passed in 1990. And, and just for those of you who um, 
when we're talking about where to go forward, she absolutely had support on both sides of the aisle when she did that. She found a Republican um, in the House who, who said, yeah, this is a good idea. Um, it was the parent of a publications kid. So you got to find your advocates when you can. So Pat Pasco is actually on the board of um, our ACLU in Colorado, which is a really nice connection. And there's a lawyer there who I've gotten close with in some, some things that we're doing who ran his own underground paper for 30 years. So, you know, again, you have to kind of search out advocates. So we have that. Um, the other thing is that we are just, and don't anybody get excited because we're way in the planning stages of this, but we're starting to put out feelers to find who would be the right people to sponsor uh, an advisor protection law in Colorado because now that California has paved the way for us, please don't tell anybody that. I see you writing furiously. Mm -hmm. We're just starting. We're just starting to find who the right people are. And I've talked a couple times with people in California about where would we go from here, what would we do, what are our first steps. Um, so that's somewhere that Colorado might be going. Was there anything else you wanted me to talk that's about? That's good. We may okay. have questions afterwards. Okay. But John, let's ask you, you know, um, um, 19 years in Kansas, um, w what impact has the law had there, do you think? I think just the mere presence of the law has made a huge difference because it's, it's an arguing point, it's a point of discussion, it's a point of basically saying this is the way it's going to be. And so that has always been nice, it's always been a nice factor. The one thing that concerns me about our law is that it's never been tested in a court. And um, I think once I'm gone, I'm really encouraging that to happen. Um, <laughs> frankly, I don't want to deal with it, but I think it uh, is something that does need to, to occur. Uh, when I, in the early days, most of the phone calls that I received were phone calls regarding print. And of late, the last two to three years, it's all online publishing. The problems generally have switched from one arena to another. Um, also, our, our law, which we passed in 1992, uh, and, I, and I was Johnny come lately on this because it basically was, I have to give credit to people like Ron Johnson, Linda Putney, uh, certainly Jackie Engel, who really were the ones that pushed our law through. And I, they did, there were three laws, actually, uh, two bills that never saw the light of day. Uh, the third bill, and, and the interesting thing was, we switched from Democrat um, Democratic leaders to a Republican, and that was the one that got our law passed. Um, and, and the reason for that is, of course, that Kansas is uh, just a little to the right of Louis XV, and most of our, uh, of our people are uh, Republicans. So we had more power and a greater power base on that side of the law or the line than, than we would have. Um, one of the things that we do, one of the problems that we see more than anything else is this attrition rate among high school journalism teachers. And, and essentially, I, I like to say that we have a third of the people who are strong advocates of freedom of the press within, among the advisors in Kansas. We have a third who don't even know that it exists. And we probably have a third who just are out there nebulously waiting for something to happen. And when it does happen, then they get concerned. But prior to that, there's not any, any interaction. And so one of the things that we do is, is we, pass, we send out to principals um, every year, or excuse me, every other year, uh, a letter which includes um, the bill itself. And that's just to, to encourage the principals to know what's going on. And then we also do a similar type of letter with, with advisors. Um, and it works. I think it, at least it, it informs them. Now, how many of these get read? I don't know. And there are probably a lot of them that hit file 13. But at least an attempt is being made. Now, after 16 years, we've decided that we need more for the advisors. And so we, our legislative committee of, of the Kansas Scholastic Press Association is putting together a brochure that goes through all the frequently asked questions and tells them a little bit about the history and what they need to know as far as uh, what Senate Bill 62 was. Because, again, 16 years, that we could have gone through uh, six advisors in the school in that amount of time. So it's very difficult um, from that perspective to, 
to keep people updated and let them know what's going on. And it's, um, I, I think the letter to the principals does help. Uh, and we do it every other year. And it's one of those things that hopefully we get some of the people that, that really need to be tapped to understand what it is that the law allows. Um, that's about it. If, if I could, I, you have just touched on John, such a terrific point, and that is our experience nationally as well. And that is that I am, I, I'm favorably impressed that you say only one third of advisors in your state are unaware of this, because our experience is that there is a, 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 a serious lack of awareness, even in the states that have relatively recently enacted these statutes. There's a serious lack of awareness all the way up and down the chain of command, from administrator to school board to to, to, to advisor, and, and that's something you can't talk about enacting these statutes in a vacuum without also talking about how do you make sure on a continuing basis people are, are aware of it. But I would also say when, when advisors come to me and ask me what, what fights do I fight, and I always, of course, say, well, the kids fight the fight, you stay back and, and, and hope hope to come out unscathed but I but I do also say especially to my newest advisors I said you I say you keep your job first and because I'm, I'm never going to encourage someone who doesn't have tenure to, to go fight this fight and and end up not having a paycheck the next morning because right now in Colorado you know it they can get rid of you for any reason yeah. any reason so um, it's one thing it's I mean, it would be devastating to me to lose my publication classes because they're what I get up for in the morning. I, I do not get up in the morning to teach remedial reading. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you. But um, it would be devastating to lose my publications class, but it would be, it would be life devastating to lose my job. And so, so even, even my advisors who do know about it, if they're, not, if they're not tenured, we tell them to play it smart. I think one of my greatest frustrations was it also is some of the stupid things that advisors get themselves into situations that, you know, if, just, if they would have had a conversation with an administrator. And I keep telling my advisors, when I advised for 22 years, I always had my editor and the principal meet on a regular basis, like once a week, go to lunch, figure out, talk about what's going on, be open with them, and, and let them, you know, the more informed they are, the better off they're, they're, we're all going to be. But it's, it's very frustrating sometimes on the phone calls that I get and they'll go, you know, we did this, and I'm thinking, dear God, you know. When I, when I became president two years ago, I said, I said, we're no longer just going to be a contest and conference group. We're going to advocate for, for a free and responsible press. And so we've started doing that in kind of pretty aggressive ways. But um, with that, I think, comes a huge amount of responsibility. And I actually drafted a letter last year to an advisor saying that the Colorado Press Association, Colorado High School Press Association, does not support the decisions you guys have made in this publication, in this one piece that they did, that it was not, legal journalism isn't the same thing as good journalism. And when we have to fight all these fights for cruddy journalism all the time, mm -hmm. then when, when, the, when the good fights that have to be fi fought come up, everybody's going to be tired and no one's going to listen to us anymore. You know, I want to get Don and Mary as two people who've been in states that have, or are in states that have was just to give your like very nutshell description of the impact the laws had there. So, Mary, you want to go first? There was a, immediately following. There was a sense of we actually it's kind of sort of like with Obama that sense of we actually did something. We've been trying for years to do something, and we actually got it passed. So there was this sort of euphoria that existed for oh two or three years, and then the reality was that the group who were very involved knew what was going on, the group who weren't involved didn't know what was going on. We tried to go talk to the principals' associations, we had meetings, we invited principals. They didn't want to listen to us. So it, I think the civics lessons from the groups who actually go through the process are the things that people take with them more than, because the students who went to coffee with their legislators and actually were engaged and involved in this process are the ones who make it happen. So I would say even if you don't get the law, it's worth it. But the, the, after the euphoria, the reality sets in and <laughs> people don't know. Yeah. You know one of the one of the things that uh, that I kind of bring from Indiana today, Diana Hadley and I have had a couple of conversations this week about this meeting. Is 
knowing when it's time. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been part of a group that has been meeting regularly on some of these issues in Indiana. And uh, we feel it's not quite time yet. The universities aren't behind it. In fact, our own university uh, was a stumbling block uh, in a hosty kind of effort last year. The people in our legislative group didn't feel that this was a priority item that they wanted to even get behind, and they worked against it, which was crazy. But uh, two years in a row, uh, IHSPA has sponsored a First Amendment Day at the State House, uh, and it's beginning to build uh, linkages with some key people. And uh, this year uh, in Michigan, I was part of Cheryl's first effort like that. And I think that that's a good step to take in any state that we might target is uh, how can we prepare the soil a little better uh, so this would be a uh, successful effort when the time's right. Don, let me get your perspective on California and, and what he. Oh, there. I'm sorry. I thought you were down there. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I want to agree with some of the things that the panel has mentioned already. Um, now, Frank, when you had mentioned turn, uh, attrition, were you talking about, I, I didn't quite catch, were you saying advisors, principals, or both? <coughs> I, I, I think I, re I, mean, I mean all of the turnover. Yeah. Okay, because I, mean, I, I think that that's one of those double whammy kind of things, yeah. that when you have advisors coming in, and very often it's you're new to teaching, no one else wants to do it. We're going to give you this job that you hardly understand. Sure. It's awful. And, and then add into the you don't have tenure issue. Um, I mean, I, I've heard from principals who say, I want someone in there who isn't going to rock the boat, someone who's going to be really nervous and, you know, doesn't even want to publish that, that much. So we get some of that. But also there's a lot of attrition with, with principals. I was just talking with uh, Kathy here how um, we have uh, teachers who one day are going to administration school, the next year they're administrator, the year after that they're a principal. And it's no wonder that they don't really understand all, all the stuff there is to understand. So I certainly agree with that, and that's, that's a challenge. We have huge budgetary issues in California. I mean, I'm sure most states do, but we thought we whipped one problem and then now our legislation legislature is getting back together to try to deal with the 11 billion dollar shortfall or whatever we have so that that factors in and I know again you mentioned that sometimes there could be financial issues it must be awfully hard to distinguish retaliation from financial if in fact a lot of other um, programs are being cut I mean I think they could make the argument if we're cutting this 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 and journalism you can't call that retaliation and I don't know how you would respond to that um, the lack of knowledge thing, I would also say. I mean, I, I've talked to administrators who, who think that Hazelwood has force in California, and I think, how could you think that? The things I would want to add to the discussion, one is fairly common knowledge, but still it's worth bringing up, and that is the importance of meeting preemptively, meeting before the school year starts. Um, we, we got a new principal, believe it or not, in the third week of school this year. And one thing I did, and I didn't do it on his first or second day, but, but fairly early on, I sent him an email with an attachment of our policies, and you know, it had all the, the, the state information, but also what we do. A little friendly, hey, this is how we like to do things. I'll meet when you're ready, and we have met several times since then. Um, and we've brought him to the class, and you know, that, that sort of thing. But, but I think that when you set the terms of this is this is what our status quo is this is this is what our policy statement is we we've had this for a long time um, and at, and and then you sit and, and if, if nothing else at least there's the communication that you've had that this is the way we run business here um, but also as much as students in california and colorado and these various states have rights what, what I like to always enforce to the students is we have tremendous responsibility. Um, what I wrote on the whiteboard the other day, because coincidentally this week we're starting in my beginning journalism class to talk about um, press freedoms and ethics and that sort of thing. I said, you can say almost anything. Of course, that's not true, but I mean, but, but you can say almost anything. But you also have to live with the responsibility of the consequences of what you say. Because whenever you bring up something like, what if a racist group wanted to have a rally, or what, you know, what, what if something really unpopular, you know, you know, that sort of thing, and, and it sort of hits them in the stomach that they don't want to allow that. 
Well, yeah, but when you when you utter when you open your mouth and say something unpopular, you've got to accept the consequences that people you're going to be labeled with that for forever forever more. So, if you want to be the person who blasts the administration irresponsibly, and you make personal attacks, then you're going to get whatever consequences come of that. That you're you're not you're not a responsible journalist. On the other hand, if you can learn how to responsibly attack the policies of administrators of administrators or the policies of a school and then also say nice things when nice things are deserved then you're going to be you're going to come across as a responsible journalist so it's that kind of education we have to have for advisors as well as the education for uh, administrators you know other questions comments about specifically focusing on how the laws work in the places they do or do they work yeah mary we had cases right afterwards, people who tried and tested. I can tell you one was um, an advisor at a private school who went storming in to the administrator and said, you can't do this. And essentially the administrator said, yeah, I can. <laughs> because, yeah, I could, you know. So there, there were sort of these things where people had to understand that it doesn't apply in all situations. And we spent a lot of time creating, um, as the law in Iowa mandated that we create this policy um, that goes to every single school that worked out explaining things and generally what they do is take the policy worked out by the committee, write their name and put it on a shelf somewhere and, ne and never look at it. Um, so when we were actually working on the policy, I think that was another time when people would come, because um, we had a bunch of lawyers and people who were working on it. So we formed a core of people who knew and understood what was going on. And it helped really to have those allies when teachers came. Um, there was a woman who at one point had been um, a corporate lawyer for um, Gannett. Well, actually, she was for the Boy Register and then when Gannett bought them up, she became a um, professor at Iowa State, she became someone that we knew we could go to because she helped us work on the policy and that she would argue. Um, so she was, and she loved it, so she would field and answer questions. Um, but after that initial period, I'm serious, Mark, it kind of just died down. Our law hasn't been tested either. We haven't had any, we haven't had it come up in court. Um, in fact, we have a, a school district, we have three uh, major school districts in our in our um, state that are out of compliance with the law. They they literally have policies that go against the law. They say, screw you to the law. They're that adamantly against it. Um, and one of those um, one of those had a lawyer write an opinion on the law. Um, gosh, two years ago now, I think. And he actually said this would never hold up in court. Said that our law would never hold up in court. But I think. I think that the importance of the law, it, he said, he called it unconstitutional and that it wouldn't hold up in court. And I was like, what? But um, I think the importance of the law is that the law becomes a calling card. It becomes an, it becomes, if I wanted to meet you and I don't know you, but I know Mark, I'd say, gosh, give me an introduction with Frank. The law is an introduction for us. The law is an introduction to a conversation for us. Right now, my, my uh, press association is working on getting, there's two major uh, teach, uh, administration programs in Colorado and they're right in the heart of Denver and we're working on seeing if we can teach a mini lesson on scholastic press rights in the Metro State College um, admin program and the University of Phoenix one and, and we haven't had a lot of success for that yet but we continue to kind of knock on the door and say hey look at our law we'd like to teach you about it hey look at our law we'd like to teach you about it because um, I know that a lot of times in, in the scholastic press community, we, we, we get really excited about kind of the full frontal assault. Let's just beat student press rights down. Everybody just go after them. But I'm really of the opinion that every, every advocate you can make kind of goes like this. And, and every person you can get on your side goes like this. And, and so, so we, just keep, we just keep talking to the right people. And every time we get an audience, we keep talking about what we can do. And, and every session I do gets a little bit bigger. And there's one more person who wants to know about it. And, and then my principal is a person who will now call another principal. I got a new principal this year. And my last principal was a wonderful, wonderful advocate for what we do. Um, and so when I got my new principal this year about, and I, you know, there are no summers for pu publications teachers. So I'd seen them all summer long as we were both getting ready for our year. And about, about a week before school started, I said, you know, Randy, 
I'd like to get some time on your calendar. And he said, Carrie, we see each other every day. And I said, yeah, I know, but I'd like to get some official time on your calendar. I need about 45 minutes or an hour. And he said, sure. Um, talk to Bev. What do, you, what do you want to talk about? And I said, I want to talk about scholastic press rights and a free and responsible student press. And I want to make sure you and I are on the same page before the year even gets started. So I sat down and I came in, I had all my stuff, and I'm like, and I, and I talked about the process that we go through in the newsroom, and I showed him that not every decision that affects his day, and that is a fair point to make. What we do in our newsroom affects the day of an administrator. For better or for worse, that guy gets the phone call long before I will, and he had nothing to do with the paper. But I said, so here's the process that we go through before we produce something that's going to affect your day. And then I, I talked about a particularly rough story we did uh, the year before, and I said, now here's what we did leading up to that story, and I took them all through it, and he just kind of sat there quiet, nodding his head the whole time, and, he, and then he finally looked at me and he said, Carrie, I've worked with you for four years. I've seen you do these stories, and I know how you love these kids. Your first thing is to educate them and do it well, and you would never hurt this school intentionally, and sometimes the press has to make strong statements. So the last thing Janine said to me before she left was, Carrie does a good job, trust her. He said, so I will, but thanks for letting me know what you do. <laughs> so well, I guess what I'm getting at, the law gives us the right to kind of say these things and to, and to be a lot more... <clears throat> aggressive, I guess, with, with our bosses than many of us would normally. Uh, that's and that's what great, I want. That's such a great yeah. point that that conversation would be a lot harder to have if there was no law on which to base it, but rather just here would, right. here's the right thing to do. Right. You know? So, well, good. You know, any last questions about of those who have the laws? Yes. Well, I had a question maybe yeah. for Frank or Mark. Or maybe. <laughs> have any of these laws been tested in court, it's said that some of them haven't. Have any of them stood up? California, California Massachusetts yeah. both have not in student, well, kind of in student press context, but but none of the other state laws. Well, what about the Bakersfield case a couple of years ago? Would yeah, you know, it will exactly. No, you're yeah. right, you're right, yeah. Uh, and that's true, actually, and, and it, although there um, wasn't a final court decision in that, I don't think. The yeah, Bakersfield was. Yeah, maybe so. You're right. Just, is that something that was not published? Oh, okay. Yeah. It was at the trial court level, but it never right. got appealed for a published okay. decision, unfortunately. So, but, but those two states, I mean, and the, the argument that these laws are unconstitutional is clearly <laughs> not, you know, legitimate. But, you know, it is interesting, and one of the strongest arguments that I, I think Frank made of opponents is that this is going to create all this litigation, and you know there is ample evidence to prove absolutely not. In fact, in you know um, um, five of the seven states, there hasn't been a single court case relating to these but standards. What, so. we've, I've had a discussion before, but uh, it, it, I still don't, I don't see that the Arkansas law is worth the papers printed on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's a good question, and James, you know, in 30 seconds or less, what, what is it that you see as the major flaw of the Arkansas the statute? The statute just says you have to have a policy, and your policy has to prohibit libel, uh, invasion of privacy, and, 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 you know, and, and tinker, but otherwise it just says you have to have a policy. I mean, that's, what I, that's, what I, that's how I read the statute. Well, and, and, you know, I think there certainly is... You're not the first person to raise that concern, <laughs> definitely. I mean, that, that obviously is a, a, a longer discussion as to, you know, what, what laws are strong, uh, stronger than the other. The SPLC hasn't ranked them yet, uh, probably <laughs> for political reasons as much as anything else. But I think Frank does give a good point of what needs to be included and what doesn't. Uh, yes. Harkening back to what Frank said initially about the need for research and details and so forth, and. Uh, Candace, maybe you'll, you can help me here. Um, our, our colleague and friend David Bula uh, of Iowa State has done some research, and if I'm remembering it correct, uh, his research downplayed the importance of state laws. Um, uh, am, I, am I recalling that a little bit? Do we need to get David on board here? Or um, what do you remember? It was a pretty limited study, yes. and, but it did indeed show that there hadn't been a ton of impact either direction. Yeah. Well, and you know, it reinforces the points that I think John and Carrie made that these laws, you know, they are not, and Frank too, they don't stop censorship necessarily. But I do think anybody who's lived with a one 
can say they do help settle the censorship conflict right. much more quickly than if there weren't a law. But it does suggest that, you know, both um, at the college and university level and even state scholastic press associations, this is a worthy topic of research, you know, the impact the law has had. Well, and, and I'll tell you, when, it, when, when push comes to shove and censorship's about, about to happen and the administrator is breathing down the advisor's neck and saying, you tell those kids not to say that, um, and I get the phone call, I say, um, ask for your administrator to put it in writing that he's asking you to break the law. And that's one of the most powerful things that I have here, is that we have a law. And I always say this, math teachers are very rarely asked to break the law. I mean, they get the Pythagorean theorem wrong in their classroom, nobody gets hurt. But, I mean, our administrators ask us to break a law, and when I say, tell them to put it in writing, that you, you have asked him as your employee to break the law. You know, Mark, Let's stop here. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, having answered the, the, the phone from people in these censorship situations for years and years, you know, the first question I ask is, you know, where are you calling from? Um, and, it, and it does make a difference. I mean, it really, it's, it's a, it, for, for me as a lawyer, uh, advising these folks, it's a matter of either having some ammunition to provide them uh, or really under Hazelwood, not sometimes. And so, uh, you know, just, just being able to go to, you know, tell them, go to our website, print out the law, and take this to your principal. It's uh, huge. Mike, on the flip side of that, it's hugely, hugely um, frustrating to continue to say the sky is blue, the sky is blue, the sky is blue, and people to tell you, no, it's purple, what's wrong with you? So you have this law and you know it's right and you go like this and they say otherwise. So I mean, but the laws are so important, even if they're too stupid to read them. Let's stop this discussion. Switch places, Jim, thank you.